those, uh, those last two presentations were just so outstanding. We're going to switch things up and talk about disasters, uh, natural disasters to be exact. Uh, we tend to focus in our daily work on stewardship responsibilities and involve maintenance, repair, funding, uh, histories, administrative histories, interpretation, those kinds of things. Those are the, those are the central focus of our work. When we, uh, every now and then something dramatic happens, it forces us to reconsider the entire way we operate. And one of those things was, was an event that happened in October, no, September of 2011. And that was a wildfire that, uh, that struck Bastrop County, which is about 30 miles east of, of Austin. Uh, that fire took about 24 days to, to extinguish. And in its wake, it left 1,700 homes destroyed. And there were, uh, there was, uh, two, two people lost their lives. It also swept through the state park which is an NHL uh, CCC park. So we were pretty devastated at the time. Uh, we actually were fairly well prepared to some extent, but the thing was moving so fast and it was just so furious that we basically had to get out of the way and let firefighters do their thing. Uh, so I'd like to uh, just so show some slides here with, with that. If I can figure out how to make this thing work. Oops. This is uh, this is a, a uh, this is the master. It's the CCC master plan of the park. The uh, the entrance is down here. And it goes up. There's a refectory and a swimming pool complex. It's got a typical park loop road. It's got a cluster of, of cabins that are up here. And uh, let's see what else it has. It's, it it also had a, it had a very unique nine hole golf course, which is kind of distinctive. CCC Park. It has it has two uh, two two uh, overlooks, and there's there's actually a road that goes off to Bishop State Park that, that connects, and it's very scenic. The the, the uh, really interesting things about this park is from a natural science uh, side, these these are the lost pines. It's just a an immense pine forest, uh, so there was a lot of material to burn, and it's also the hab the habitat for the Houston toad which was uh, an endangered species. So when this thing hit, it was, it, was, it was devastating for a lot of different groups within our program. Uh, this, is what, this is what we typically think of when we, when we think about our, our physical materials. We think about the CCC guy who's preparing the masks for the, uh, for the heart supports in the refectory. And just the playfulness of the materials, just losing this kind of thing loses the connection. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. 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 Uh, losing the physical material is one thing, but to lose the connection to the period that made the park so distinctive in the first place would, would just exacerbates the loss. Uh, these are the types of structures that, that, uh, that we have in the park. The refectory is on the top left. We have 12 cabins, at least 12 cabins. Uh, we have two scenic overlooks, both of these. This one's is called Fair's Overlook, which was high up on a, on a, on a trail. Uh, Arthur Fair was the architect who was most uh, responsible for the work in the park. We have this, there's a cabin that you can see on the top left. There, there was a lake just immediately adjacent. We'll talk about that maybe later. Uh, you can see some of the problems. The, the, uh, the CCC like to nestle their, their, their structures into, into nature, which is a blessing and a curse because there's a lot of material there to burn. Uh, I love culverts, so I threw a culvert in. These, the, they're just, just such incredibly beautiful things. And uh, we learned a lot about culverts because there was so much material exposed after the fire. Uh, typical CCC drawing in the top right. Just the playfulness of the drawing is... They're, they're, they're just so, so, uh, so wonderful to look at. And you can see the interiors. This, we, we connect to the CCC, we connect to the CCC boys, but we also connect to the user, the visitors who come to the park and, uh, and do it generationally. They, they, they keep coming back, the families keep coming back. And there's just, just a, such a sense of playfulness. You can see the, the amount of use that the, that, the, that the cabins get. So after the fire, we... Uh, 
we had to do a condition assessment. You know, we were allowed back in the park, and one of the, the fairs overlook was was extremely concerning to us because it, it, we lost we lost two roofs in this entire thing. We lost two roofs, one on each overlook. The rest of the, the rest of the buildings were spared, and Fran, I think we'll talk a little bit about that. But the uh, we asked Fran to come out to take a look because we had a, a, a FEMA representative, uh, an inspector, come out, and he condemned fairs overlook. He said, we, can, we cannot, we're not going to give you any money to put this thing back together because it's just too far gone. I looked at it. I wasn't convinced. I asked Fran to come out and uh, that began a dialogue that resulted in us applying for a grant with uh, NPC, uh, DT and, uh, and we were awarded the grant. So this, this, this study is an outgrowth of that, of that award. Starting here with a dramatic uh, image, um, the Bastrop Complex wildflower, wildfire uh, was our Labor Day wildfire. It began on September 4th, 2011, and it was the largest wildland, wildland urban interface wildfire in the state of Texas and the third nationally. The wildfire spread at a rate of five miles per hour for the first few hours. Wind speeds encouraged heavy spotting, and it was estimated that spotting distance was um, really as far as three miles. Extreme heat and wind also created vertical and horizontal vertices, which propelled the fire forward, increasing its speed and, crown sp um, its, speed and its crown spread. And I won't leave the microphone, but <laughs> um, the little green button. Okay. Um, you can see where is that? Oh, okay. Okay, got it. You can see that the fire. Uh, covered quite a large area, and Bastrop State Park is right in the center of the area of the fire. Well, I may be, I think by my count, the fifth speaker who has had a video that does not work. Any betters? No, I don't read well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this video. <laughs> shows the power and the speed of the wildfire. And it really is sort of shocking to look at it. So I'm going to talk about the aftermath. Um, as Dennis mentioned, the Bastrop Complex wildflower, wildfire, um, I guess that's a Freudian slip on my part, impacted over 32,000 acres and nearly 1,700 structures. Many people lost their homes. And um, it did affect 96% of the Bastrop State's uh, pine forest. Um, and shocking to me, immediately following the fire, there was up to a foot of ash in many parts of the park. The CCC cabins and the day use structures um, were, were spared. Battling a blaze of this size required a coordinated effort among several fire departments um, at the, both the local and the state levels. Bastrop State Park own fire department worked to save the CCC structures, but the larger fire was battled um, by local fire departments, the Texas Fire Service, and from uh, firefighters from as far away as California. Um, all the visitors in Bastrop Star State Park were evacuated thanks to the quick and effective efforts of park staff. Um, and as you can see as this image, firefighters um, removed pine needles and uh, doused roofs with water. Um, they also built containment lines to stop the fire from spreading to populated areas um, of the county. And here's a map, and Dennis, as Dennis mentioned, the cabins 
um, are around Park Headquarters, which has this um, Texas Lone Star. Um, the overlooks are at the other ends of the park road. Here's uh, the Lost Pines Overlook and Fairs Overlook. Um, the overlooks were more difficult to access. Um, they're in remote hilly areas, um, and they were also in the direct path of the fire. Um, and I, I think it's fortunate that the cabins were uh, located in an area that could be accessed and were not in the direct uh, line. Um, Dennis mentioned that the overlook structures uh, were not um, completely spared. Both are in uh, remote locations um, that were more difficult to, um, to access. Part of our um, work with the grants project was to assess the effects of the fire on cultural resources in Bastrop State Park. Um, and we look both at direct impacts as well as indirect impacts. And regarding direct impacts, um, obviously the wood was um, um, a, a critical factor here. Um, some information about uh, burning temperatures and the uh, temperature of the fire itself. And what we found uh, uh, typified by this slide was that you have one charred horizontal beam and some charred remains in uh, some of the lower beam pockets. Uh, most of the sandstone used to construct the CCC structures was quarried locally. During our post-fire inspections, we were concerned about the dark color of the sandstone of the overlooks, which, as you can see in this image, appeared charred with granular disaggregation. We suspected that the sandstone had suffered thermal shock and was altered at the micro level. However, our laboratory testing, uh, which included uh, scanning electron microscope examination, provided no definitive proof of the fire's direct impact. Um, sandstone matrix appeared intact, and the micro cracks and gaps between the quartz grains and the crust were judged to be pre existing conditions. Um, I want to mention that this work was done by our graduate student, uh, Miriam Twarek. Hofstetter with the assistance of Dr. Earl McBride, Professor Emeritus at the Jackson uh, School of Geosciences at UT. We also looked at the direct impacts of the fire on mortar. Um, and those effects were not obvious during our post-fire inspection. There was some dark colored soiling, but the mortar appeared to be intact with little powdering. Um, that said, the exposure to the high temperatures um, may impact the mortars over time. And for this reason, we recommended monitoring its condition during maintenance inspections. Perhaps the most serious impact of the fire um, were the indirect impacts uh, due to erosion. Um, and indirect impacts occur as a result of fire-induced changes to the sites where historic resources are located. Considering the extreme loss of vegetation during the fire, the park was at increased risk for soil erosion. The sloping terrain of the park was a complicating factor. Slopes ranged from gentle, um, which is uh, 0 to 5 percent slope, to very steep at greater than 20 percent slope. Um, the official report issued by the Texas Forest Service um, indicated that there was increased risk for water erosion issues in more than 30% of the affected area. And in fact, problems did occur uh, in January 2012 following a severe storm. Um, many of the CCC culverts, Dennis's favorite um, uh, cultural resources were soiled and damaged by soil erosion, and the conditions included stone displacement, losses, and silt and debris covered stone. Uh, emergency repairs were required. Um, now that I've kind of gotten everybody in a depressed state of mind, I'm going to turn it over to Casey with some encouraging news about what we learned from the fire and how to prepare for the next one, which 
we expect will be coming. Okay. Oops. All right. Um, so yes, my my part of this um, project was to um, see what could possibly be done to help prepare a, a, a park um, like this for a worst case scenario, which had already happened. Um, and how and someone mentioned yesterday the idea that your cultural resources are sometimes at war with your natural resources. So how do you prepare for a situation where your natural resources become an imminent and horribly dangerous threat to your cultural resources? Um, and, and what we found looking, trying to look for information was that there wasn't a lot out there for specifically for this type of a park situation where the, the design was for, imp or for structures to be nestled into their, their surroundings, their forests, a lot of the um, preparation documents were for house fires um, or um, things like that with historic buildings. So what we kind of I focused on was um, a three-pronged thing, um, basically um, preparing the building, preparing the site, and preparing the people. Um, so substitute materials for the building, um, defensible space for the site, and planning and documentation and communication for the, the people who will be involved. Um, Substitute materials, and, and what I found was there's no, there's obviously just like in most things in preservation, not one answer for everything. It's a situation by situation um, problem. Um, so the Bastrop's part or cabins do have fire rated wood shingles, um, which was kind of the best that could be done balancing the historic integrity of of these um, that had wood shingles originally. So that's something that as cultural resource management staff, you'd have to weigh out the, the danger of, of, of a fire, a possible fire if you're in a fire prone area to that, um, you know, substituting out the original materials. Um, but it is definitely worth um, looking into. Defensible space is also one that's tricky in these parks because they were in, in their original design designed to be tucked in and subordinate to the, the surroundings and the surroundings are right up next to these buildings, um, and a lot of these um, parks, you know, built in the turn of the century, didn't have all these codes. Um, so I looked at, at defensible space codes that are de designed for new construction, um, housing, and, and buildings built into wildland. Um, and they're very, they make sense for new construction, but they're very hard to fit in with these, with the the scenic. Um, park situation, um, but I did um, compare these. They all have a radius of 30 feet where they really don't want any vegetation at all within 30 feet of the building, so I'm not sure if there's many national park settings that that would work with. Um, but I, I, it's a good start to look at to try to see how they can be adapted to a park situation. Um, they're all very similar. Um, wild urban interface code, the FireWise and California code all kind of basically say the same thing. Um, trying to, to lessen the fire load around the buildings. Um, and this is an example from National Park Service did in Baker Island, Maine, where they took those principles and they really went, they went with it. Um, they, uh, so um, I don't, this is one that I put up as an extreme example, but um, it's one that, um, as again, would have to be a case-by-case -case basis. They restored this back to what it is, it's, its period of significance didn't have all of this um, you know, all of the growth coming up around it. And so to, to protect the, the lighthouse, they, they cut it back. Um, they, and it was a controversial decision, but it, now that structure is much better protected. Um, this would not have worked in Bastrop State Park. The whole purpose of the park would have kind of been obliterated. So there's a balance that has to be struck um, with that. But we just, I, I wanted to provide some guidelines of something for, for the parks to use. Um, and I think up, above and beyond was the most important was to assemble a team and be proactive about that. Um, talk to and, and have cross training between the firefighting team that might be the one called into your park um, and the cultural resource management staff um, and let the CRM people talk to the firefighters and the firefighters educate CRM people about what could happen if a wildfire hits that specific building, that specific area. They are trained to read the terrain, the, the, um, the vegetation. They'll be able to tell what will go up quickly. And then at that point, there would be a balance of a judgment call of how you can balance the historic integrity, the landscape design, all of that with um, the things the firefighters would probably tell you need to 
get out of the landscape. Um, but that's that was a key thing. Um, the firefighters at Bastrop went to heroic efforts to save those cabins, um, and they were aware of the culture, the importance of those buildings beforehand. Um, so walking through your site and actually talking to a wildland certified wildland firefighter and looking at those structures would be um, important. Um, and then just kind of um, it prescribed burns in parks is important also. Um, and then prepare the structures, um, document them in case worst case scenario they're lost. Um, and then do regular maintenance to remove fire loaded um, um, materials that could cause a problem. Um, and then um, get them as prepared as possible in case a fire could should get near. Um, the defensible space thing again with the fire is a good um, thing to um, to talk with a, to work with a, a team on um, and try to balance your park with the um, with the uh, possible worst case. Um, and then if the worst case happens, there's um, we, we I, I developed a, an assessment form to, for um, going in as soon as it's safe to go back into the building um, to assess specific things that are um, become issues with a wildland fire. Um, so the erosion issues, um, things about the, the building that um, are typical after a fire. Um, and those are things that you would want to get in as soon as possible to make sure that the damage is basically stopped where it is as much as you can. Um, but the erosion and flooding is one that is specific to a wildland fire com compared to like a house fire. Um, and at Bastrop it really played a big role later on. So that's something that would be um, important to kind of um, try to mitigate uh, so you don't have secondary damage there. This is the first page of the form. It's a three-page form um, to try to go through each um, individual uh, resource and, and evaluate it after a fire goes through. One other thing that is important to you know, if you have um, if you have like a little cluster of buildings, one of those little park um, villages, if if there's um, a way to make sure that you have a really good source of water, a fire hydrant there, that's um, that was the challenge at Bastrop. They didn't have a fire so a water source very close, and it was very difficult for those park roads for the fire department to get through back to those. Um, so that's one that can be, as a, if there's a cluster of buildings, that's very a good, um, a good thing to put up if you're in a wild fire prone zone to make sure there's a really good reliable source of water. Um, but this, this was kind of a worst case after the fact assessment form. Um, hopefully no one will have to use it, ever, <laughs> but probably. Um, so that's this, those are the, the team of, of folks that um, worked with the, from the firefighting team all the way down to um, all of us to, to who put this project together. So.